Hello and welcome to the start of our Let's Build a Game series. This was originally going to be made a made for YouTube series that just chronicles the development of a an Android game from start to finish. But I got about 10 minutes into the planning phase and I realized that my writing speed is not anywhere near acceptable for a practical YouTube series. Let me just mute myself over there. Um, so we are starting from absolute scratch. There has been no planning done on paper for this, although I've had a brainstorming session with a friend. Um, that all said and done, let's get started. So the basic idea of this game is that it's an infinite runner game, so you might have played Jetpack Joyride or Temple Run or... I know there was a Ninja one at some point that I used to play a few years ago. The, the, the idea of an infinite runner has been done to death, but I think I've got a fairly unique spin on to put on it. We So the new Dungeon Keeper game came out on Android a few months ago, and we got right into it for a little while. It's um, It's got this PvP base building mechanic where you want to set your dungeon up to be as good as it can be and hope that it survives the wrath of other players. So the idea that we've got here is very similar. You've got an infinite runner game, you've got a single player mode that you're always running to the right, you're collecting various coins, power-ups, points, whatever, and um, they all accumulate as some sort of experience or currency there, and you can um, spend that to make your own little slice of an infinite runner world um, basically as uninhabitable as possible. And so then there's a multiplayer game mode where the rewards are a lot higher, and what that'll let you do is um, you'll be running through other people's slice of, of their world, and if they stop you, they get rewards, and if you collect the bits that they have to put in by... Um, well, they have to mandatorily add, compulsory, that's the word, um, then you get the rewards for collecting the good bits and missing the traps. And so the idea is that the game will have some pre-made chunks, and it'll have some player-made chunks, and it'll just string them together infinitely, and the players who make, made the chunks get rewarded every time you make it, every time you die in their chunk. So that's the basic idea and I also want to include now I'm pretty sure biomes is a word that Mojang made up but basically biomes, I want to start it out in an urban area, that's the phone ringing. Alright, that's better. I want to start it out in an urban environment sort of area and then slowly change it out to be more of like an outskirts type thing, you know, more um, it's bad stereotype, but more dilapidated houses and whatnot. And then we want to go even further out into fields and forests and maybe a bit of a desert type of, type land eventually. And then a literally absolutely ridiculous distance out, I want to break the terrain. So what you'll have is a, a suburban house, followed by a dune, followed by a creek, followed by another suburban house that's up at the top, upside down or something. I want to recreate the old Minecraft Farlands idea deliberately. Ooh. So Australian in the chat here, he's, he's my only moderator at the moment. He has just dropped a link in chat to the dictionary reference of the word biome. So that's that's handy. It's not made up. <laughs> but either either way, let's actually get started. So the date today is the 17th of March 2014. It's um I just find it's handy to always date always date my pages. I've been using these notebooks for a few years now. I actually bought about six of them so that they'd all look the same on the bookshelf. I'm only up to the second one uh, after about three years. Um, but I use them for everything. My book of secrets. It's, um... So we're making a game. We've already got a name for it. Normally I don't come up with names until a lot uh, much later in the in the development process there. 
but I figure this one needs a name and a logo before it even before it even has a solid structure behind it just because I had this idea to do a series out of it and so I did a bit of thinking ahead and I'm pretty happy with the name and the logo although the more I think about it the less I like the name it'll do for now um, so the ideas behind it we've got the infinite runner my handwriting is terrible and slow always running right and I might um, have a power up that makes him run left for a little bit and the terrain that he runs left through can be different than the terrain he runs right through as in no backtracking just uh, as if the game was going continuously forward now I don't know if that's going to be readable at all actually but uh, this will be more diagrams than text by the time I'm finished um, in theory actually let's do that a little bit now so the world is organized into chunks so it's, it's a format that I've been using for pretty much all of the games I make it's the idea is to never have a loading screen between maps and so you've got you'll have chunks suited one after the other and the only rules for a chunk is that it can't have half an object at the edge because the other half is not guaranteed to be in the next area so in each chunk you've got your power-ups let's say coins for now might always be coins coins are a bit generic though I'd like to think of something else that would be suitable in there but say we've got you've got coins that you, that you can collect and then at the end no, no, not another circle we'll use a rectangle you'll have say a laser and so then the player pretty much has to make a choice does he collect these last three coins here or does he go safely around the laser later on you should be able to get a power up that will allow you to literally get to this last coin and teleport through the laser say the power up would teleport you forward about four units of space I should probably make my diagrams a little bit bigger actually now that because we're talking about the size of text and everything um, then your next chunk might be I mean the game the game won't allow you to have the same chunk twice in a row but for all that matters mechanically the next one could be the same chunk again it could be a different one I'm hoping to come up with some rules for generating chunks so that they can be procedural but for, but, uh, for the most part I expect it to be pulled from a syllabus of handmade chunks so that um, so that it's the game's consistent it makes sense and you've got a you've got a constant level of um, real danger rather than glitch danger because there's nothing worse than the game giving you something that's impossible to beat so you would have buildings in the background here Yeah, that's a terrible building at least to begin with now as for story what we want is you've got say some sort of relic it's, relics are always egg shaped <laughs> and someone somewhere probably Indiana Jones style I don't know it's um it's not really well thought through yet but someone somewhere a stupid man collected the relic and it made everyone run to the right everyone in the world and so you don't just have this one hero that say escaped from a lab or this Indiana Jones character running th running from the temple that he's activated this relic in you've got the entire world always running to the right and that allows us to open up a little bit of character creation I'm not an artist that might be infeasible for me to add in the end um, but I want to have you know how you've got your um, separate hairstyles and actually Starbound does it well for what I'm trying to think of um, but you'll have your set you'll have your separate parts that make up a character and I want this to be as 
not as customizable as possible. That would that might make it a little bit too complex. I just want you to be able to have your own unique identity within the game. Um, so I want to be able to have just on the head alone, let alone let alone the body. Um, I want you to be identifiable just from your your generated profile picture from the character creation. So so you would pick your hair, you would pick your facial features, maybe um, some accessories like some glasses or a beard or something. And um, and that would be that the game would take effectively take a picture of of that, and it would distribute that with your level. So no real information, no real names or anything. Uh, possibly your username, but maybe not. I haven't really thought that through with the security and privacy and concerns. But you need an identity in the game, and so I would I want to tie that identity to leaderboards to. Uh, level slices, your own your own slice here, and um, eventually guilds or similar clans, whatever whatever the most appropriate terminology works out to be. So we're really getting towards towards the end of the just overview phase of design here. Um, soon we'll look at actually breaking down actual game mechanics. You know, like whether it's better to have him running along, have your character running along the ground and then jump every now and again. Or whether it's better to have your character be able to um, fly more like that and then always going forward and then fly again like that, so jetpack style. Or, um, I don't know, there's lots of different lots of different ways that we can do this. I personally lean towards the free, fl the free flying style um, because that lets you, so you would have a locked forward speed, aside from some power ups or you know meet short time boosts. Uh, you would have a locked forward speed, and then you would be able to control the upward speed in a physics sort of way. So you, you're touching the screen to thrust up. Um, there's another way. There's another control method that you could use. That is, um, you've got say effectively a slider. However, you want to implement that, you could have. Um, so when your fingers on the screen, that's where that's the height of the character, and he's always going forward at a set motion at a set speed as well. Um, I don't like that idea so much. I feel like a physics-based, a fast physics-based control system would be would would be the most challenging and interesting. So there would be a specific rhythm that you have to get into to collect a sine wave of coins to really otherwise. Uh, jumping would make that impossible, collecting the sine wave of coins, and I feel like the slider variant would be too easy and add literally no challenge to the game. Um, yeah. Now I'm at a blank as to what I'm going to talk about next. So we've got power ups. We've got we've we've vaguely mentioned traps, but the idea is always the same in every game. There, with it, with a trap, you're going to touch it and you're going to die. Or maybe we'll have lose some lose some of these coins. You'll uh, maybe explode in coins that you either have to quickly collect or or lose. I don't know if I like that idea very much. Maybe you can have three or four three or four uh, lives. And then every time you hit a trap, you can lose one. There's there's a lot of ways to handle that as well. I haven't really put a lot of thought into that. I don't see this game format. I feel would work really well if you were just gonna die and start from the start. But it would be a different set of levels, a different set of chunks loaded. Um, I d I don't think. You, having health is going to make too much of a difference. It would make the, the individual runs last longer, which might make fewer people play it, because I know these days a lot of people, casual gamers in particular, want a, a game that they can pick up for 10 seconds and put down, or just as easily pick it up and play it for hours. So I really want to have that, um, that hey, you can stop here moment f as frequently as possible without saying, hey, you should stop here. Um, so I don't want you to lose too much progress when you go back because that's the biggest thing that people will say. Oh well, you know, I've that's that's a stopgap right there. I either, I either spend the next ten minutes catching up to where I already have been, 
or I stop playing, which is much more interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, roguelike is actually a very a very strong influence on the on the chunk system I've I've got in mind. Um, I actually really do relate to that with with the starting each run again and and having it be different. It's, um, so the idea then becomes you want low health. Procedural, not terrain generation, terrain placement, I would say. else have we just talked about here? Uh, jump styles, discuss in more detail later, perhaps as we are prototyping. Backgrounds really not that important for for this. What else can we? Uh, no lives, yeah. No he low health, of course. Uh, well, I'm pretty happy with that. It's just a super rough scratch up for the concept conceptual part. Um, I'm going to move over to the other page, and we can start talking about actual actual. Uh, design from like a program perspective so let's fill in the date over here and the topic and I'll go back over here and add on stream now most of this series will be uh, you'll just sort of have an IDE in the middle of the video here, just the development environment, and it'll be coding. But we might switch back to the paper fairly often. I'll try to get here at least once a night because I think it's an extremely useful tool for communicating design choices. Um, I need lighter. How are we going for light? That's a little bit better. Um, I would like to put in graphical nods and references to other games or, and movies. Um, I feel like I'm already gearing up to have a handful of Minecraft references, which I don't know if I if I personally like that or not, but it's probably going to happen. Um, I'm thinking of having yeah very direct references like Indi and like an actual uh, Indiana Jones hat. I don't. I don't think he wears an Akubra, but um, the idea would be that it's a nod to Indiana Jones rather than a specific style of clothing. Um, the the say the hat would come with a whip accessory, of course, things like that. Just uh, just the tiny nods to pop culture, and probably as many of them as I can as I can afford to fit in, without directly ripping anything off. Um, I do want to have this actually narrated by an by a real person, one way or another. Uh, we can look into that a bit later in the in the process. I'll be tweeting out to f try and find people to help out. Um, I'll probably offer to pay a tiny bit. I don't know how my how my financial situation is going to be at the time. It seems to change a lot. Um, but I mean, I I th I'm really not sure how this game's going to pan out. Whether it'll be just me the whole time, which I can do that. It'll be a, it'll be a much lower quality project though. I've got a sound guy that might be interested. Interested. He's expressed a little bit of interest, so we should have um, some some decent sound coming in. 
at some point later in the process. I want to get a at least a, at least a playable prototype up and running first before I even talk to him about that about actual themes and tunes. Um, but at the moment, it seems like it's. I mean, at the moment, it is just me working on this. And you guys, of course. You guys are welcome to give any hints or tips or opinions or um, or ideas or even open up a dialogue about about perhaps committing some some work of your own. It's. I don't think this game's going to be wildly popular. I don't expect to make a living off this particular game at all. I just I just feel like I really want to complete this project. <laughs> and so that's that's where we're at with this. Now, I'm not sure how we got so derailed, but let's go with some actual design. So we want to have at least when you t when you open the game, you want to see a splash screen. So let's say dot 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 presents. And then um I'll make that so this is this is a prototype, so this is we only the only reason we would include a splash screen in the prototype is just to get our basic structure correct. So later on when we do want to add a splash screen we've got the facility for it. Rather than um having to change the entire architecture of the game, like the entry point and everything. Um because I've had to do that before. <laughs> So we would have we will have a splash screen and eventually so I'll actually have two comments uh, two columns here proto and final and so prototype will just say timed changeover to title in the final we'll have a fade effect animated logo and some form of sound now none of that is locked in at this point we're just working out the rough bones of the game of the application and so next up so that's we'll give it a title it'll be called not title splash then our next screen through we'll just turn into title. Now this title screen here, this is your first point of interaction. It'll let you choose single player, multiplayer, um, it'll have some sort of dungeon mode, so you know creating your slice, and then it would have an options an, and an exit. And then over here on the right hand side, so this game will be landscape only, for sure. Everything about it will be landscape. Um, I, I feel like that's the most sensible way to put way to, way to make a game like this. But on the right here we'll have some form of maybe a ticker from Twitter or or something. I don't think we'll have in-app purchases. I don't know yet. I, I do highly doubt it. But some, you know, like a news section, like a, a an extra content section one way or another, whether it comes from Twitter or what, or a marketplace. Um, maybe it can show your, la your latest achievement, actually. That would be a good idea. And so we'll have just an open padlock picture for now. That'll do. Um, and so single player, multiplayer I want you to be able to play with your friends so you hit multiplayer and you'll be able to run through online dungeons so that's that's not really multiplayer, that's more online um, so your game will cache a, a, a good set of chunks um, well in advance so it'll download them so it's not it's not going to be buffering your gameplay as you're running 
and it it'll mix out it'll mix in the multiplayer the other people's dungeon chunks with your own uh with with the single player handmade chunks that we were talking about before over here um but I do want you to be able to play with friends so you'll be able there'll be multiple modes in there that'll go to it that'll throw out to a different screen um which will which we'll outline down below, but for now we'll just add that it throws out there. Um, which we should do for each of these other ent entries as well, but for now I'm not going to. So in the prototype, we literally are only going to have tap to start. That's literally the entire screen there. Now in the final, of course, we'll have menu items we'll have the background animated we'll have um, your unlockables unlocks slash news however we end up implementing that we'll have to discuss that in more detail later um, we're also going to have, of course, the name of the game. So up here, we'll call that just far for now. Uh, game title. And then underneath that, we'll have the theme song, which should That was Banjo-Kazooie, if you missed that. My microphone just had a bit of a hernia. Um, I want it to be really uh, light and fluffy and Nintendo 64 era. Just that uh, that bright colours sort of feeling. Um, so, should we... Should we outline the single player next or the multiplayer I think we might even leave the multiplayer off this I wonder how long my microphone was muted for just now <laughs> so I don't know if we should actually outline the multiplayer here because this is just a rough as guts bones of the application sort of this is what we're going to make in our prototype phase so I think I might just leave the the more complex multiplayer and options menus out of this particular plan uh, because this is just throwing together this is what we're going to throw together over the next week or so hopefully as often as possible I would I would like to be able to stream this every night uh, but I do know that I have a full a full sort of work schedule coming up so we'll just take it as it comes at the moment oh good I didn't um, my microphone didn't cut out for as long as I thought then I just noticed the red light was on at the end where it was uh, that usually means it's muted which I don't know if it's uh, playing up or not but either way we're going to at least outline the single player right now because that's going to be our prototype phase. So what we're going to have in the single player, this is where we're going to build our control scheme, our game mechanics, the uh, really flesh out whether or not we use health, or how, how the chunk system is going to work. This is going to be a good page or two of planning in itself, just the single player part. Um, but the single player is going to have, and this is all just for prototype here, the final will evolve naturally as we start planning the other modes, or as, as we decide the prototype is, is viable. Um, I'm just going to take a drink of water. That's better. 
so the single player here is going to have our coins it's going to probably not for the prototype won't have traps um, it should by the end of it at least include um, some sort of loading a level. We'll look at things like XML for that, but that's not set in stone. We might use some sort of binary format so that so that we use less space, but I think XML can be pretty quick to read in um, because really what this is all about is the ease of uh, the ease of creation in, at the end of the day. So we don't need to be super worried about limited di disk space or anything. I mean, f mobile phones these days, some of some of them can be very, very restricted. But mobile phones these days, it's normal to get one with eight gigabytes of memory built in, right up to thirty-two or sixty-four. So it's so using a binary format just because it's small isn't really that important. But we will at least look into it to see what's what's going to be the quickest and easiest at the end of the day. Um, which I'll do all of my googling and research on the stream as well so it'll, it'll either be you'll either have the paper I might be talking directly to the camera at some points it'll, uh, you might have a web browser or the actual coding or art going on because we will need to whip together some basic art assets um, and we'll need to learn how to use Box2D properly because that's the physics the physics engine we're going to use, and I'm completely unfamiliar with it. So, the single player here, we do want we want the coins at minimum. We want coins. We want player control, and this will be a trial by fire. We're going to just try and try and try again and see what happens, see what sticks and what feels like we've thrown it at the wall. Um, and so that that's going to be up here. This that's going to be our jetpack versus our jumping versus our slider versus anything else we might think of in the meantime. Um, so we got the coins. We got the player control. We we do want a scrolling background if as a minimum. Probably not parallax yet. Parallax is where you've got multiple layers in a 2D world and they're scrolling at different speeds to give the gives the effect of distance in the background. It gives the effect that the mountains are really far away because they're moving slower than the trees in the foreground. Um, we're, not, we're probably not going to bother with that for a prototype phase. We'll just make sure that the background can loop end-to-end -end without too much trouble. Um, we might break that out into its own thing so that later on it's easier to to upgrade it to parallax. Um, we are also going to want to add the ground, of course, and the ceiling. So these will be physics based. Um, so we need to really, that's where we're going to do our primary research into Box 2D because we want them to be solid solid bodies in the world so the player can either bounce off, off them or stop. And so that brings us to the different types of controls again. So if you've got, say, I would normally draw the ground in here, I suppose I should do that, and uh, the ceiling too. So say the player is accelerating upwards for whatever reason when they hit here what happens they can either continue on forward and just scrape their head and you would if you were making a real game which we are you would have something like a sparks animation or something to really indicate that that's not okay um, and so you can either have the player just scraping along there or you can have the player actually bounce off a little bit. Now this arrow is exaggerated, the bounce wouldn't be anywhere near that big, but um, it would be a very visible bounce, probably with its sound effect and everything, to really uh, just make it, uh, it, it would disrupt the controls, so it would make it harder for, harder for you to control against the upcoming trap whatever that could be 
so the incentive would be to fly around like a normal person rather than a crazy person um, and so then you've got the floor which is the opposite the floor so the player should always be moving forward in infinite runner game so we'll have a minimum speed and a maximum speed and we've gotten behind the logo now so I'm going to move this up onto my keyboard a little bit um, the player will always be moving forwards so we need a minimum speed at a maximum speed and then the same principles as the top. Should the player bounce off the floor, or should um, or should the player just sort of glide along the floor? Because so the ceiling in particular, right? You're we probably won't have a fuel system for jetpack-based flight. I don't know, um, but either way, go. So in a real world, rather than a game world. You're, you're expending something to be flying upwards, and so the game is going to try and discourage you from doing that um, it, any way it can, because at the end of the day, that's it's effectively button mashing, but without the mashing. It's like holding a button and not really getting anywhere. So, but holding on, going on, the, going along the floor, that's the direct opposite. That's not pushing a button at all, and so. I don't know whether so the, I don't think the player should bounce off the floor but I don't think the player should survive too long doing it either so we can have all sorts of we can have friction on the floor that'll slow the player right down to their minimum speed that way it could be used strategically um, or we could have no friction on the floor and so the player maintains a steady speed although then I don't know how the player would actually uh, decrease in speed. I think the player will just decrease in speed linearly anyway when they're not holding the, when they're not holding the uh, increase button. Or then we could have the player continue at a specific minimum speed that's not necessarily the minimum speed, and then something to the effect of buttons or humps or something something vaguely uh, something vaguely upwards shaped that the player would hit and bounce off of probably with a gravity type trajectory and so that would uh, make it potentially dangerous to stay on the floor as well because you would have one of those probably at a at a an appropriate distance before any major traps and so I'm thinking of implementing those anyway regardless of what happens when you hit the floor just as a sort of if you hit this then you have basically hit the trap as well so it's sort of like a two-pronged approach to the traps um, there's a lot to talk about in the design of this game but I think that might almost do it for now I think what we can talk about is the actual programming aspect what we're going to actually need assets and code wise to get a prototype up and running so for us so we've got our multiple screens actually I'll add the I'll add the floor and uh, everything in there some coins because coins are important and of course our squiggly line trap that I've been using which I suppose can be the uh, first one that we and our hump why not can be the first one that we implement. Probably a, a squiggly line electricity trap, maybe some spikes. I want all sorts of traps. Um, I want some some background activators. So you'll go past, say, say a, a box in the background, and that will cause. Um, so just intersecting that box. Excuse me. Will cause, say, an arrow trap to fire or something. Um, downwards, of course. But what we need is multiple is what we need is a uh, multiple screen handling system. So we need to define some way of switching between them. So on our next page, again. we are making Farlander
we want multiple screens and we need to think about how we're going to actually handle that oops I forgot the word screens and I am left-handed so that looks as awkward as anything um, so with our multiple screens we want a screen type of some sort so let's say an abstract screen now I'm not going to call this a tutorial at all but I will try and explain everything in as low level as possible as I go um, I'm not sure how so I don't expect you to go from from not knowing anything about programming to being an expert while watching this this is more more targeted at people who are maybe a few months into learning programming but are still starting out um, like I, I'm, I'm not going to try and teach you programming so much as I'm going to try and teach you game design and game development um, but that said I, sh I shouldn't really go too far too 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 far from the norm but we want an abstract screen which means basically a a fake screen so you've got you've got a screen here that's um it represents what it means to be a screen rather than an actual screen and so it it's it's like an outline i suppose is probably the best way to put it um and then you're going to have your splash screen and your title screen and your single player screen, I'll just call it single for now and all of those are abstract screens and so by by making the, the actual screen abstract we can then use any or, any or all of these interchangeably later on so what we need is a screen handler so the actual game itself will start up and it will say hey you screen handler my arrows are very flat tonight um, it'll say hey you screen handler give me the first screen and the screen handler will say hey okay I've got one of those it's a splash screen for you whereas this game up here the box doesn't care what screen it gets it just needs a screen yeah, Oz, I might actually do that. I might need to fill out some sort of bio. The description underneath the, the stream that specifically... Like an FAQ section that says that this is not a tutorial, this is an adventure. Because I feel like it is, is much more appropriate to call this an adventure. <laughs> it's um, I'm going on this journey and you're all coming with me whether you like it or not. Actually, no, if you don't like it, you're not coming, I suppose. <laughs> and so we need to define that screen handler the screen handler let's just call it sh for i better write it out in full somewhere so that we know what sh is it's just a fairly long name and a shorthand is king on paper so the screen handler is the opposite of abstract it's what we call concrete so that means it exists it it not only defines what it means to be a screen handler it has the guts of a screen handler too. If you if you put this into it, you'll get that out of it, rather than not knowing what it will happen. So the screen handler is going to have uh, it's going to need to say it's going to have it's going to have a current screen, and so that's going to be the rest of the game when it wants to know whether whether we should be drawing a title screen or a splash screen or the game screen it's going to say screen handler give me your current screen and that current screen is going to be our abstract screen which for now will just be AS I'll actually add that up here and so that current screen can be literally any of any of the things that are an abstract screen and so that's that's the base of our game engine right there is is the game is going to say what's your current screen 
uh, the screen handler then needs to change over the current screen. So when you go from a splash screen to a title screen, it's uh, there's stuff that needs to happen between there. The title screen needs to load its um, it needs to load what it needs. You know, its music, its um, its background images, its all all its all its guts and glory. It needs to. So uh, that was a change screen. We'll probably go set screen, but for now change screen will do. Um, and so what that'll do then, this is where we, we start to get indented, uh, the change screen will call the current screen. It'll say, hey current screen, you need to look at going away. So we'll call that dispose. We'll, you need to look at throwing all of your stuff away. Then um, it'll say, all right, once that's finished, which later on we might have a phase in between here so it's not all instantaneous, um, you know, something so that we can add transitions, maybe a screen will fall off the, the actual screen, um, maybe one can be loading while one is while one is unloading, we'll work that out as we go. Um, but it'll, so after we throw away the current screen, we will say, we, we actually might even not throw away a screen. We might store it for later, but in the prototype at least we'll throw it away. Um, that, that'll that be something to consider later. So so that way, if you go back to the title screen, there's no loading for the title screen anymore because it's already been done. It's just been set on hold and stored. Um, but for now, we'll throw it away. We will then say, all right, new screen. So up here, we're giving it a new screen of some, of some sort. So a new, a new abstract screen. Put AS in our box again. Um, so we're giving it a new screen, a new screen of any kind to put in. Then we're gonna throw away the current screen and then we're gonna say, okay, the new current screen is our new screen from up above. And then, now that we've got a new current screen, this current screen is not the same one that we had a minute ago, we're going to say, current screen, load. Or initialize, initialize it first, and then it can uh, look at loading its, its own stuff, probably as part of the initialize. I'm, I usually design things so that I initialize and then load but it's starting to seem a little bit redundant. I think I might just leave it at initialize and that can also load at the end. Um, but that's how we switch over from screens. We The screen handler doesn't care what, what, what individual screen it has because each of these are all coming from the one so they can all do the same thing. So they can they will all be able to unload themselves, they'll all be able to initialize themselves. Um, and then each screen in particular, we should actually outline the abstract screen now. So each screen in particular has a, it's going to have a an enter, which is its initialize. It's going to have an update, which is saying, hey, all the stuff that needs to be up, uh, all the stuff that needs to be updated, of course. It, uh, it's going to say, all of the stuff that needs to be in motion, you know, anything that's animated, anything that needs to to happen, and uh, things like your input, so anything that needs to see whether or not I've been touched, like a button, is going to um, is going to happen here. It's going to say, "Hey, update," which is actually called update, funnily enough. Um, then we're going to have a render, which I think just after having a look at libgdx, it looks like update and render might be combined into the same thing. But the render is where the magic happens, it's where it says, okay, you, you're visible, I want you to appear over here on this part of the screen, and um, I want you to appear over here on this part of the screen, I want you to appear on top of that thing. And so that's, the, the rendering is where the data gets passed from the processor, from the from the update stuff, so the update happens first, the update sets all the positions for this particular frame, and then the render method is going to 
is going to draw the pictures. It's going to give the graphics card all the information it needs to actually draw the picture. And then we're going to add an exit at the end, which is our dispose. So we're entering, we're updating, we're rendering, and then we're disposing. And not, it's, so we're going to enter once, and then we're going to loop through these again and again and again and again and again until the screen handler asks it to stop. So that's the life of our screens. Now that is literally about the most complicated thing that we're going to work on for the prototype. The rest is pretty much all downhill. That's, that's the crux of the engine though, right there. And so you've got the game is going to literally say, I'm going to even call it G. We'll even fix up up here. Move my page up a little bit. Um, the game is going to ask the screen handler, oop, that's an ST, a screen handler, hey, give me a screen. The screen handler is going to say, here is an abstract screen. We don't care what it is for this exchange. The game is then going to take that abstract screen and it's going to say, you abstract screen, I want you to um, update and then I want you to render. Uh, so render should come from update. And then it's the game is going to say, all right, Here's back to you, game. Well, the screen is going to give it back to the game. The game will then go... Uh, it'll do exactly the same process over and over again. It'll say, hey, screen handler, give me a current screen. Current screen, happen. And then in this, in the update here, th that's where all of, your, um, all of your logic happens. And so within this, there could be a... The, the screen might say, okay, I'm done here, officially, screen handler, please transfer over to a different abstract screen. And so, whatever that could be, our screen handler will say, okay, and it'll go from there in particular, it'll go into its dispose and enter phase of its changing its new screen over. And then we've got the same loop again. The game will, well, the game will just say, "Give me your screen." It'll be this. It'll be a different screen to last time, and it'll go through. It'll update. It'll render, and it'll loop. And then um, it'll just continue looping forever until we tell until one of these screens in the update here, where the logic happens, it will say, "All right, game, we are finished. Let's all go home." And so then, then the game will say, screen handler, shut down, dispose your your screen. The screen will go through its all its unloading thing, and then the game itself will finish. You'll come back to your home screen on your phone. Um, I keep saying phone and um, and touch. This is actually so it's primarily aimed at Android, but if nothing goes wrong, it should also work just fine on desktop and hopefully web. Um, I know libgdx, they're still talking about adding iOS support later on. I don't know if that'll be a thing that actually happens or not. We'll find out the hard way. Um, so this has actually been fairly conveniently timed. It's 55 minutes into the stream, so in about 5 minutes time I might stop the stream um, and make sure like before before the memory goes i might um i might give it a bit of an outline and everything in in the description in twitch and then start streaming again 5 minutes later because i want to i want twitch to be able to throw this directly over to youtube as much as the writing is a bit slow i do want the archive of it anyway so we will try and make this into a series i might actually now that i can see how long I've been streaming for at a time, I might consider doing that every stream, just cutting it off at the knees at an hour and uh, then restarting it up again, just to make any, any sort of editing really easy.
but on that note we're almost ready to start programming. We're going to go back into another page, make sure the date hasn't changed from, from time to time. So um, a lot of the time I write completely different dates, sometimes different years from page to page, and I don't even know why. Uh, we're working on Farlander, still, again, as well. Now that we've got our basic outline for how screens are going to work, we need to work out what our, what our individual screens are going to do. So our, we're going to have our splash first, and this is much more in depth than our last page, the page before where we designed, uh, defined our splash screen. This is going to say what it actually does. So when it enters, when, we, when we're loading, so on enter, we are going to we are going to keep a reference to the so we're going to keep the handler, the screen handler, which I'll keep as the same notation as before, sh in a box. Um, and so that'll store we're going to store that in the splash screen. Um, feeling like this part of the video is at, out of focus or something. It's Weird. Ah, the light, of course. Um, we're going to keep the screen handler. So this is where we load all our stuff, bear in mind. We're going to uh, load in an image. So load an image. Which means we're going to need resources over here. I'll make a column off to the side. I'll just call it, yeah, no, resources. Usually you'll call resources, um, just for easy naming, res. Um, so we need an image. That's all well and good. And we will set our timer. which the actual numbers we'll set for the timer, we'll play with those as we're actually making it. Probably say about three seconds, so about three seconds. And that's all for our loading of our splash screen. That's all that really matters. We're going to... So after, we're, after we've entered, that happens one time, and then our update and render is going to happen repeatedly. And so in our update we are literally going to just say timer subtract. Subtract the delta in particular which I will explain in one second. Oops, that's the wrong symbol. Um, so the delta in particular, in, ga in game development terms, is the amount of time, usually in seconds, or milliseconds if it's, um, we use seconds, seconds makes more sense. Uh, it's the time in seconds between frames. So if you've got a game running at 60 frames per second, like most games do, at least on PC, you've got a delta of roughly 16 milliseconds, because so to produce 60 frames, you've got you've got your 1,000 milliseconds in a second divided by your 60 unique frames in that second. So your 1,000 milliseconds divided by your 60 frames gives you about 16, I think about 16.3 give or take, but it's about 16 milliseconds per frame. And so running locked at 60 frames per second, your delta will almost always be 0.016. Of a, of a single second. Um, that's extremely useful for physics and um, for physics and animation because that allows you to time everything. So, say if you if you just said if you ignored the delta and you said minus a fraction of a second each time. So the timer we said um, minus point point zero one just for easy math. If we said that, so this way to do it, um, 
if you said that every frame and then your frames weren't all the same length which is very common so say you're loading something briefly that will cause speed up and slow down issues because say you'll be able to take out 60.01s in this second and then the next second you'll take out only 48 and so your time will be extremely inconsistent and not not related to real time um, conversely you get games sped up the same way so um, if you've got if you ha if you were doing this with an addition say on a on a on a position so you had something moving to the right and I don't know if you remember graphing from high school or if you're even into that at all but usually the further right you go the higher number your X value is the um, if you've got an if you've got a time step that's not fixed and you're not taking into account the Delta you'll have a wildly fluctuating speed. You'll be able to see the character speed up and then slow down and then speed up and slow down based solely on whether or not the processor of the machine that you're using dis uh, thinks you should have the attention. Um, so using a delta is a way to catch the distance between frames. So it might, it might be 0 0.0161 one time or it might be 0 0.014 another time if you if you slowed down. But the idea is that at this current point in time, we have moved this specific distance in time. So you can you can graph your thing, uh, gra graph your animations at a constant speed. So you can say, all right, game. Um, it actually also makes it really nifty to manually speed up a game because instead of doubling the amount of frames that you're doing, you say, all right, pretend that you've got double the delta and so then the game will happen at twice the speed you've got the guy you've got the guy moving twice as fast per frame because it the game thinks there's been twice as much time between frames um, the the delta time here is one of the most handy game mechanic uh, game so I, I like to think of game development as you've got a toolbox full of different tools you've got your screwdrivers and your spanners and your nuts and bolts and uh, Stanley knife um, all sorts of stuff in your toolbox. The delta time is one of the most handy tools that you'll ever have in the toolbox. It is far and away the first thing you should learn everything there is to know about if you're getting into game development. Um, there was an article called Fix Your Time Step on a blog that I read a couple of years ago. I will try and find a link and put it in the description of the YouTube video at least it's super handy and on that note I'm actually going to stop the stream right here right now um, so I'll be back in a couple of minutes